Hello, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, my name is Brian Pitchman. I'm from the Evolve project. Uh, and what I'm talking today about is about leveraging cloud technologies to help boost your startup. A lot of what I present on uh, is working with libraries to help them partner up with startup companies to create libraries as a beta, um, where, where people have a new idea, they go to a library to test it out, try it out, and leverage the patrons to see whether or not it's, it's a viable idea. And at the same time, libraries offer a whole plethora of resources that people can use. So that's kind of where my background is. I've built a couple of different startup companies throughout my life. Uh, and so today we're focusing on uh, a few tips and tricks that, that I've used to help businesses scale. Um, most of what I see is when, we, when somebody launches a new business idea, for instance, um, they have to be very well organized and, and follow a couple basic processes and procedures in order to be successful. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about some of those processes and procedures, a little bit of project management and how we can uh, leverage some of that uh, methodology into scaling, uh, as well as the tools that are out there to help either scale faster, communicate, collaborate, uh, and work together. So I always like to ask, you know, what would you do if you had a million dollars? Um, most people, when they have a, have, a, have a startup idea, for instance, uh, they don't have that plethora of money sitting off to the side. Um, so you have to get very scrappy uh, and figuring out ways to accomplish things. Uh, I built, so I built the Evolve project all through the art of asking. Um, and so in my background, I used to work at a public library in Mokina, Illinois. And we wanted to renovate the library to be the most interactive and engaging library in the world. Um, but to do that, I quickly found out I needed money, which as, as, a, as a library, we didn't have those kind of funds uh, off to the side for us to do an entire remodel for a children's library. So what I did was I partnered up with startup companies. And so I called up different companies that had educational pieces of technology that I wanted to incorporate in our space. Uh, and I brought them in there to let them, uh, let patrons learn how to code, create circuits, all those types of things. Um, we were one of the first libraries to build a maker space to the point that Google actually came out and we were the first library to have a virtual tour done by Google. And I did that all without much any funds. Like my entire budget was $150,000 to renovate the entire children's section. Um, and I was able to do that through just asking people, what are you willing to do and how are you willing to help? So I'm gonna show you a lot of tools today. Uh, and all these tools I either got for free or heavily discounted because I asked. I said, hey, I'm a startup. I'm trying to use uh, this tool here. I don't have the funds to, to spend, but can I use it for a year or two? Uh, and most people are very uh, agreeable to that. And so if you ever have time, um, check out The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And she kind of walks you through how important it is to just ask for help and get, get, get assistance. So to kind of kick us off, uh, the startup model as a whole um, goes from brainstorming to branding to marketing, social media, and eventually into funding. Um, and there's this whole, I'm not going to dig too much into it because I want the meat and potatoes of today's conversation to be about the tools. Um, but the idea is that everyone goes through this progression. Um, you have an idea because you want to solve a problem, something that the world is missing. Um, and there's all these intermediary steps where you, you, have a side project or you survey your users. And it's very important that we do those things. And I will show you uh, some of those tools that I like to use to do surveys or to gather data and act on it. Um, the kind of a, a good brainstorming exercise as well that I always like to kind of leverage is the business model canvas. Um, and it's where you write down in these boxes of who you're working with, what's your value proposition, um, What's your cost structure like? Where are you going to get revenue? Where are you going to get resources? Uh, and so I use, I like to use the Uber example because most people know what Uber is. Um, and as you can see, they, they place their, their business ideas before Uber was Uber. They did this exercise. Uh, another thing uh, to consider is about your brand. Um, and so one of the, one of the products or one of the tools I like to use, or service rather, it's called Fiverr. And I'll just talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, but building a brand, the things you have to think about is what does you want your brand to say? Um, they say that a brand has a personality around it. And so some of my earlier projects, so when I was in college, I built a computer repair company called Cirque. 
and it stood for Computer Installation Repair Company. And our slogan was pointing in the right direction. So we were professional, we were polished, we had polos with that very simplistic logo in it. When I first launched the Evolve project, we wanted to incorporate, we wanted to make it friendly for everyone. Um, so we wanted to introduce technology to boys and girls. And one of the most gender agnostic um, things is robots. Uh, everyone likes robots, um, except maybe Sarah O'Connor. Uh, but the point was we wanted people to feel comfortable and wanted to gravitate to bringing technology into the library space. And so we decided to use robots because there's not many people that say, I don't like robots. So again, with, with brand, think of your brand as a person. One of the best examples of this is the I'm a PC and I'm a Mac commercial that was around, I want to say like 10 years ago, um, where you had your PC, which was like, supposed to be a boring person. And then the Mac person was supposed to be cool, friendly, hip and going. Uh, and so that's how they wanted to present themselves. At any point too, if you have questions, feel free to interject in the chat. Um, I'd, be, I'd be more than happy to pause and answer them. I, I know I talk fairly fast, uh, but I do have a lot of content I wanna cover today. So feel free to interact, interject, ask questions so we can dive in some more. Uh, the other thing that we talk about when we talk about brand is brand is a personality. Uh, and they usually staggered across five pillars, um, sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, and ruggedness. Uh, and so how do you want to sell yourself or what, what do you want your brand to feel like? Um, so when we talk about using tools that are, are public facing that our, our users see, we want to make sure the tools we use match our brand. Um, so if we're hip and trendy, we don't want a very boring uh, survey to go out or very form letter um, mail subscription. Um, so the idea is we want to make sure we utilize the tools to match our personality as well. Um, and then just in general, uh, as we build our brand, we start building relationships. Um, you build that consistent tone of voice across everything you do. So everything matches and everything uh, feels the same. And the last piece I want to talk about brands is brands should be experiences. And one of the best examples is Willy Wonka, um, the candy, the candy company uh, or Wonka. And so when you think of that, all their, all their candies are very fun, fun. And like, they like the movie transport you to a magical world. Um, and so when we talk about our brands, we should also incorporate our experiences as well. And so again, when we choose tools and choose software and products um, for our company or for our startup, we wanna make sure that it all kind of is cohesive and matches. Um, you, never wanna, you, know, you don't want your business to look like you uh, puzzle pieced uh, puzzles from different collections in order to make your business. You want everything to look like it's supposed to be there and fits. So kind of putting this to practice, and again, I, I presented this from the perspective of libraries, but this applies to everyone. Uh, when people want to work on ideas, um, you want space to work. Um, so having whiteboards, or if you can, get smart boards. Uh, they're digital whiteboards, so everything you write on the, on the whiteboard is recorded on the computer. Um, you want very specific pieces of software to document ideas, um, or using a, a tool called telepresence. So if you're working with people like, as, as the entire world is right now uh, remotely, you want to be able to video chat with people from anywhere in the world and communicate and, and brainstorm and work on projects. Uh, one of the things I always encourage people to do, like Do Space is doing, is hosting workshops about business models, branding, marketing. Uh, and if you're not the expert, always ask your local community members. They're more than happy to step up and provide assistance. Um, so as an example, when I worked at the library, we wanted to do a fishing program. And so it turned out one of our patrons was an avid fisher that had his own fishing company. Uh, and so he presented tons of fishing programs for the kids, uh, which was widely popular. And he even gave away tackle boxes and fishing reels um, for free for all those individuals. Um, and then when we talk about marketing, uh, marketing is all about building relationships. And so when we have to make meetings and whatnot. Meetings are probably the worst things to schedule uh, because everyone has varying calendars. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about some of the tools today that I use to help me build those relationships uh, with marketing because it's very hard to co coordinate, uh, especially across time zones. So a few of my partners are in China uh, and so their time zone is vastly different than mine. And so being able to know their schedule and whatnot and, and plan for a meeting 
our window to actually meet is fairly narrow. Um, and so it's all about using the right tool to meet our to, to meet expectations and to work together. Uh, the other thing uh, that I always like to encourage people to do when we talk about the importance of marketing and the importance of reaching out is expanding your circle of influence. And that is the concept of uh, the best example I ever heard is you only have one mom. Uh, and so the idea is you want to keep asking, who do you know? Who do you, who else do you know to help promote your business, to help promote your idea or what you're trying to accomplish? And so the idea of the circle of influence is I know a group of people and those people know a group of people in order for me to get introduced. I need to leverage the people I know so they can introduce me to people that they know and slowly extend out farther and farther and farther in the circle. Um, LinkedIn way back when had it actually had a GUI to actually showcase the circle of influence, which I thought was really amazing. And so whenever I posted really cool or cute little pictures, so this was a, a boy with a rocket that says, believe in yourself. If you don't, who will? Uh, and I was able to extend outside of my circle of influence and reach um, 11,393 people uh, or yeah, uh, outside of my network or 1,143 views uh, from that. Uh, and then when we talk about social media, it's a good point to kind of dovetail. Um, there's a lot of different social media tools out there. And so there's, our, there's actually platforms that actually sync all of your social media content into one one format. So when you're reviewing content or posting content, you make sure it's consistent. Um, to be honest, no one likes logging into to Facebook, Twitter, all these apps separately to make it the same post. And so we'll talk about this in the tool section. Uh, so when we choose our social media, the first thing we want to do is make sure we choose social media that matches our users. For instance, um, this is from the Pew Research Center. Uh, and they were, they were measuring uh, the majority of Americans, who, what do they use? Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, et cetera, as well as what age groups they are. So if I wanted to reach, um, you know, a lot of people between 18 and 20, between the ages of 18 and 24, my best choice or my best software would be using YouTube because it has the largest market share on the right. Um, if I wanted to reach people that were um, 55, 50 or over, some of the better tools are actually YouTube and Facebook. Um, not necessarily Snapchat, as you see, is only 7%. Uh, and so understanding your users, so that's also part of why we want to look at uh, when you do your business model canvas, who is your target market, because then this then dovetails into what social media platforms you're going to be using. Um, and here's a bigger blown up chart of the different demographics based off of age, gender, um, uh, ethnicity, et cetera, or an income. And so I leverage this spreadsheet whenever I'm helping uh, people grow their businesses, who we're trying to reach out to, let's use this chart and we know what social media tools to actually leverage and reach out to our future customers or future users. Um, and then this is just another graph that kind of shows that, that content of how many people use said tools each day. Um, and so then this thing goes into how frequent should you be posting things on your social media platforms? And so you want to, it's called scheduling your posts. So 51% of your Facebook users check Facebook several times a day. So if you have content, uh, you'll be, you want to make sure you post several times a day. So those individuals will see it. Um, somebody asked the question, will you be sharing this PowerPoint? Uh, yes. Uh, I can share this PowerPoint and then they wanted to know, the other question was, where can we get those charts on an updated basis? Um, let me go back to slides. I gave the link at the very bottom right um, for where the Pew Research Center uploaded their social media content. And they do it every two years or so is what it seems like because they did one in 2016 and the one in 2014. Um, so I assume there's going to be a new one coming out soon. Um, but again, that link is at the very bottom of this slide. Uh, and then here's just an infographic that kind of highlights that data. Um, a little bit easier to see what type of social media platforms you should use if you're wanting to reach specific users. Um, and then comes the fun part, the analytical part. Um, so I always tell people when you're launching a business or you're launching anything with social media, you want to measure it. Um, the importance of, of measuring to make sure that you don't waste your time or waste your efforts. So um, 
for instance, if you set up an, a LinkedIn and a Facebook page and you're making posts, but your LinkedIn page isn't getting any hits, you're wasting your time using those tools. Um, or the other thing you can do is find out why people don't seem to gravitate towards how you're using it. So the two tools that I always re leverage is commune.it or community is the, like the long phrase, um, where you can even plug in like your business name and it'll, it'll ping you if someone searches for it or tweets your company name out on Twitter or Facebook. Um, Hootsuite is another tool that's, that's fairly good. Um, the downside is that, that the free version isn't necessarily that great anymore. Uh, there's becoming less and less free uh, and more and more pay for use. Uh, but regardless, it's a great tool. Um, and as I stated earlier, you can always ask and say, hey, can I get this at a discount? I just started a business, um, especially if your startup is like a, a for the public good or social impact. Um, so if you're, for instance, printing out uh, PPE uh, to reach out to these companies and say, hey, we're, we're providing a social service. We're printing out PPE. We don't have that much funds to leverage some, some of your tools, but we like your tool set. Can you work with us on a discount or get it for free for X amount of months? And a lot of people actually respond relatively positive um, to that. And if they hesitate, I always explain, hey, I would be more than happy to uh, write a blog post about our partnership um, do a review for, you know, how well it worked, uh, or how well your tool works or be a reference for you. If someone needed more information, I'd be more than happy to kind of present for you. Um, and so doing these things, you can leverage your own time to get uh, the software for less. So kind of putting it all to practice. Um, so with marketing and social media, uh, most likely you'll want access to software such as the Adobe Creative Suite to create said multimedia. Um, if you're creating films or recording content, you'll want a uh, private space to film it, um, soundproofing rooms to record content. If you are working with a library, see if there's equipment that can be checked out to create this content. Um, so I, a lot, I help a lot of libraries set up um, multimedia rooms where you can check out cameras, video cameras, lighting, et cetera. So you can use those tools to leverage and build your own equipment to business. Um, attend or host workshops on marketing, social media, photography, video editing. There's a lot of content out there. Uh, and there's a lot of great webinars um, that are free that you can join uh, and learn specific skill sets from. Um, if you're looking for a website to do uh, like on-demand style training, Stack Social uh, has a whole tool of su um, suites. Uh, so you can download a how to use Adobe Creative Cloud for 30 bucks. Um, and it'll teach you everything you need to know about using Adobe. So I'm gonna kind of dovetail a little bit and talk very shortly about project management um, because there's tools that we'll want to uh, leverage in order to project manage successfully. So I always like to, this is one of my, my favorite little memes about uh, what projects are you working on? Uh, and you know, who, who is on your project team? Uh, and there's always like thinking back in the college days, there was always the person that that fit into one of these four buckets. Uh, it's it's very very true, and it's interesting. Uh, but not everyone has a team that they're working with. A lot of startups are just one man bands as as they're called. Um, but you still want to apply project management methodologies to yourself, as in you get a project management tool and you hold yourself accountable and you build a project plan, even though it's just you. And the only person that you can upset is yourself, using a project management tool will save you uh, time and time again. So just general definitions that um, you may hear when you talk about project management. Um, deliverables are essentially things that you want as parts of the project. So those are like your plans, documents, legal paper. Um, deadlines or due dates. Uh, and the important thing of all project plans, if you've ever been on a project before, is calling it scope. Um, and scope is basically what you are agreeing to do, and you don't want to go outside of that. So you don't want to say, hey, I'm going to paint the kitchen today, and then go, you know what, I'm thinking I'm going to paint the uh, bathroom too, because it's right next to it. That'd be scope creep. If your plan was just to paint the kitchen, um, don't start painting another room, don't start replacing lights, it's just paint the kitchen. So um, project scope management, uh, there's a, this is an infographic that kind of keeps you on track. Um, by following this process, you'll be successful. 
So while you're building uh, like a project or working with others, um, the first thing you want to do is schedule and figure out how much time do you need. Um, and if you aren't working as a, if you have a team, managers of said team will be able to help determine uh, how much time activities will take, how many people uh, or materials required, and then the order of these activities in order to be successfully completed. Uh, I always tell people when you're building a project plan or working on a project, add buffer time. So give yourself pad to either catch up or um, improve something if something was, was off the mark. Uh, and the other thing is document actual hours spent working on a project. Uh, and this is very important. So even if you're doing something by yourself and you're like, hey, I'm building a new website for my company, um, track how long it took spending or tra track how long it took you to build that website uh, because uh, using a tool like Workfront, you can find over time um, either A, how efficient you were on doing something or would it have been cheaper to hire it out. Um, so if it took you 80 hours to build a website, but a website design company says, hey, they can make it in, in 20 uh, at this cost, because even though you're, even if you're working on your own, you still have a cost. Um, whether or not you're getting paid for that cost, you still, it still costs you money to focus on a website versus focusing on sales or growing your business. Um, so using a tool like Workfront or just an Excel sheet to time track is very, very important because then you know how long it took you for those projects. If you were doing billables for like your clients, for instance, um, you can at least leverage your, your time that you've done previously and say, all right, I've done this project before and it's taken me 65 hours and these were all the work buckets I had. Um, so it's always good to document. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about project management from, from that perspective. Uh, estimating time accurately is important. Um, it talks about, and I'm not going to dive into these, but uh, the uh, big picture is using these tools will help you make sure that you stay on, pa uh, on track. Um, developing work buckets will help you learn how to funnel and solve and focus on uh, very specific action items. Um, there's different ways to figure out your requirements. Um, these are some of them, uh, and these are just workflows. So how do you think through a project? Um, and so these are the things that can help trigger ideas or trigger thoughts. Um, so when you're developing a project plan, the, the idea is you break your project plan into buckets, and then with those buckets, you can estimate your time fairly accurately uh, of how long something will take. Um, the other thing you want to do is when you're developing plans or working on projects, is always list out all of your assumptions, exclusions, constraints, um, things that in order for you to be successful, something else has to be done and to highlight that. Um, and this, this will then dovetail into when you're onboarding software for your business. So if you're including a new tool, um, I've gotten in the habit of, of running a project plan around the tool you're implementing. Uh, because then if you, if the tool isn't successful, you know how to kind of roll it back or how to remove all the integrations you may have built. Um, and then also the other thing is when you're, when you're doing your time tracking, um, they say that assume your resources are only productive for 80% of the time. Um, so if you gave someone 40 hours to work on a project, only 80% of those hours will actually be focused on that project. Um, there's other things that come into it, such as uh, unexpected events, everything from sickness uh, to having an accident, emergencies, uh, software crash, et cetera. And so they always say add that, that buffer in there as well. Um, because your resources aren't always productive 100%. Um, it's usually about 80. Um, and then uh, project methodologies, there's three main ones, um, Agile, Waterfall, and Six Sigma. And I'll, I'll dig into those at a very high level, and then we'll jump to tools. So Agile, it's a continuous cycle. Um, it's hence the word Agile. Um, so you're always gathering requirements, you're building a plan around it, you're executing on the plan, you're developing, you're releasing, uh, you're seeing how well that task and or activity went, and then you start doing the next set. Um, it's, it works really well when you have very small but very collaborative teams, and it allows you to kind of evolve and improve, and it's very customer-centric because you're, you're, you're sending out deliverables that your customer will be using, or your end user, um, so if it's an internal uh, piece of software, let's say you're, you're developing um, your customers or then your employees. Um, waterfall is slightly different. 
um, waterfall in order to go to the next stage in the project plan, the one preceding it has to be completed. So in order to start designing in a waterfall plan, all the requirements have to be gathered. Um, it's very sequential, it's very linear. Um, you definitely want a project manager working on this one um, because you wanna make sure you stay on task. So if it takes you too long to gather the requirements, then your design phase will be pushed back, uh, which then means your implementation and eventually your entire project is delayed. Um, Six Sigma, uh, it's very, very different. Um, with Six Sigma, uh, it's about defining what your goals are, what your objectives are, and then measuring it. And so you, with the Six Sigma methodology, you can't implement a process or procedure unless if you measured and analyzed it. Um, so there's no guessing. Um, all the decisions you make have to be backed by data. Um, and so that's a, a, a very good process. To kind of, even, though you're, even if you're not going to follow Six Sigma, doing that core component of only making decisions that have data that can back it will save you a lot of time. Uh, and then in general, uh, not all projects obtain the goal. Uh, so if one of the probably the best examples I always like to hear people talk about is, hey, we built a SharePoint site in order to get people collaborating, um, but people aren't collaborating. Uh, and so if you did the Six Sigma uh, process, your data points are, would it be you would know why people don't collaborate. You wouldn't develop a tool to get people to collaborate. You wouldn't have to, you'd have to understand why people aren't collaborating and then develop a tool to fix that. Um, so just in general, so this again kind of dovetails with libraries. Um, so if you, are, if you are a library listening in, the idea of teaching patrons about, or if you're doing a project that impacts your patrons or employees, um, you want to put the emphasis on the experience um, because if the end users are going to be part of this, this project, uh, you want to make sure that they're trained, they're onboarded properly, you announce that project and so forth because at the end of the day, no one likes surprises. Um, and over communication, while sometimes can be annoying, it's very important, especially for impacted parties uh, because then it allows you to get in front of any issues. So if someone's complaining about something but you're doing constant um, conversations, or announcements about what you're working on, you can at least get in front of problems. And then having a central location for information. Uh, I've been on plenty of project teams where uh, one user likes to save all their files to their Google Drive, but another user likes OneDrive, another person uses Box. And so when it's time to pull content together, you have no clue which platform to use. Um, so when you're building projects or you're saving files, save them in the same space. Even if you're working with other companies and other vendors, um, you say, hey, we're using my OneDrive. Uh, I will share a folder with you and you can upload files to it. Because so you don't want to have to hunt and peck across different tools and software in order to find content or files. Um, and then a good project plan just in general. Um, you have deliverable goals. Um, the idea is it's called SMART. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Um, and then you want to identify all your risk and problem areas. So where can something go bad? Uh, and the other the last piece with project management or just onboarding a tool or anything in general uh, is always set expectations and sharing them. So saying, hey, if the vendor doesn't meet us by this deadline, we're going to be delayed by this many days. And explaining that to either your shareholders or your end users, depending on the situation, um, perfect, uh, helps you avoid disappointment, uh, which then derails your project, even if it was something that was great and amazing would help you know, save the day or save the world. Um, but if there's all these uh, missed deadlines because of a vendor, you're gonna be one to blame because you never brought up this type of risk. So when we collaborate with documents, so as a tool, um, Google Drive and OneDrive are probably the most common. Uh, I really like Google Drive more than OneDrive because it highlights everything very, very well. Uh, and I can see in real time, oops, in real time, uh, the story, if you will, of who edited what and when. Uh, and I can leave comments and I can assign tasks to people. I can highlight a, highlight content and put assign to and assign someone to fix it. Uh, so using, using Google Drive is very, very nice uh, when you're working on a document with multiple people. OneDrive has very similar settings as well. They can even do revision set, revision history, just like Google Drive. But that setting's usually buried and it's not turned on by default. Um, so I gave you a screenshot of how to turn that, that feature on 
Um, so you can kind of do product revision. So someone doesn't go in, delete an entire paragraph, hit save. Um, if you don't have version sa settings saved, you'll never know what that paragraph used to look like. So make sure that's on. But it works very, very similar to Google Drive where you can see in real time what people are working on and how they're editing it. All right, um, so meeting tips and tricks. So as a startup or as a business or just in general, um, meetings are probably the vein of everyone's existence. Um, and so these are the things that I always like to hold people accountable for when we have a meeting. Um, and it's called, the first one that you may have heard of, it's called parking lot. Um, don't get stuck in the weeds about a topic. Let's say there's two people that are one on tangent and they're arguing back and forth about something. Just say, hey, and it sounds weird to say it, but hey, let's parking lot this and talk about this outside of the meeting. Um, the other thing that you wanna always encourage people to do uh, is meetings are for discussing and deciding. It's not for communicating updates. Um, it's here's a problem, we need to work through it. Um, so if you do have, have meetings that are talking about updates, recommend doing that through an email. Um, and then everyone that, that leaves a meeting should always have action items. Um, and then the comment is if they don't have an action item, action item, then they probably didn't need to be in that meeting. Because again, the meetings aren't, meetings aren't designed for communication. It's designed for discussing and deciding. Uh, and especially now that most of the world is working remote, uh, leveraging this as your um, foreground or your platform of how you're gonna manage meetings will make your life a lot better. And the last piece also is designate a note taker and stick to an agenda. Um, and again, you wanna save this file in the same place you're saving everything else. All right. um, have there been any questions about some of the processes or procedures with, or tools that we can use, or processes and tools to be successful with a startup? Uh, also more of like a, a toolkit now. Okay, uh, there's no questions. So again, feel free to interact at any time. I'll be more than happy to answer. So here are some of my favorite tools that I leverage for um, building startups. I always like to joke that as soon as you, you know, you buy a domain, it's, it's kind of serious now uh, for, for building your business. Um, the first thing I always like to focus on when you're, when you're building a business or you're, or, or you're a new company um, is always, always focusing on your team because um, your team's gonna help you become successful. And if your team isn't happy or they're not educated or not confident, your business, ain't, business will fail. So a strong team should be well educated. And so there's two tools that you can use, uh, Medium and Blinkist. Uh, Medium is probably, you've probably seen it before. It's, it's uh, people write articles and they post it. And then it's usually it's, it's somewhat reviewed by, a, by, the, by the community so you can see how many people are responding or what they're liking about it. Um, but the other real great tool that I like to use in a subscription, it's called Blinkist. Um, so how many of times have you went to a meeting or you went to get coffee with someone and they recommended, hey, read this really great book about project management. Read this really great book about dealing with difficult people. By the end of like, uh, uh, if you go to a conference, for instance, by the end of that conference, you'll have like 45 books you have to read um, because they were all recommended. So I use Blinkist where it will actually summarize most of those books that people recommend and give me what's, give them to me what's called a blink, um, which is like a three or five minute segment on a chapter in the book. So you can basically plow through um, a bunch of recommended books to read and get those, the main picture items out of it. And then at that point you can decide, all right, I actually do want to read this book because those topics were interesting to me. Um, so medium on the left, link is on the right. So these are some of the, uh, the books that, that I was reading when I, when I grabbed the screenshot or listening to, um, these are all really great stories that I was able to breeze through, if you will, and then determine if I wanted to actually read the book later. Um, as it relates to the team, the other thing that you want to do is make sure your team is uh, rewarded and or encouraged. Um, and so there's, there's three, there's three apps that, that I've used before. There's Kudos Now, Growbot, and Office Vibe. Um, Growbot and Office Vibe, what they'll do, they'll integrate if you're using Teams or Slack. And so we'll actually message randomly your team members and ask them questions such as, 
you know, when was the last time you received praise? And it's, it's like four or five questions they'll ask once every other week, I think it was. Um, and then it, calc it, it grabs all this data, all this interaction from all of your employees, and it gives you this. Um, and then it lets you know what to focus on. And so I did this for one of, one of the teams I was working with. Um, and the team for the most part was, was very, very happy. Uh, but then we found out that uh, a few of our, most of our team members actually responded and we didn't know who responded with what, um, their wellness. They didn't, they didn't take care of themselves. Um, and that, that includes everything from not sleeping, uh, staying up all night, bad, bad eating habits. Um, but we knew that there was sometimes some of our team members would struggle throughout the day. Um, and so we were able to leverage this tool to understand what we needed to focus on and launch wellness, in wellness initiatives, et cetera, to make things better. Oh yeah, I can go back to that slide, sorry. Um, so the, the, the links, and again, I'll share the whole slides for the uh, PowerPoint as well. Um, but Office 5 is what I use. The, the screenshots are, are showing Office 5. Um, and it's a really great tool. Um, I used the free version for like a month or two because I only needed the data. I needed the data for just two months because then I wanted to act on it. Um, but I think they're going to cost per user is relatively cheap. And so with Office 5, um, it gives you this report as well. And then you can see an engagement score, and then it kind of summarizes their findings, uh, what people are working on, what we should improve, what we should care about. Um, and it was a really, it's a, it's a really great piece of software. Um, and here's another app, uh, simply that does very, it's like a, like a Slack, but it's more focused on giving people challenges or giving people praise. Um, so that's, that's working with teams. The next thing I want to talk about is um, surveying your users. There's, there's Google Forms. Uh, I think Microsoft has a, has a Forms now. Everyone seems to have their own survey tool, SurveyMonkey. Um, but one of the, my favorite surveys to use is Typeform. And the reason why I like Typeform is it looks like this. It looks like a website. It doesn't look like a survey. It doesn't look like a form. And as it asks you questions, like where you see A, B, C, D, E, I can hit the A on my keyboard and it selects my age as under 18 or D on my keyboard and it does 35 to 44. Um, and it makes people, it, it, it gives this environment where people want to fill out the survey or want to fill out the content. I see higher usage or higher response when I use uh, type forms to survey my, my uh, users. What's really cool about type forms now, uh, it has all these logic steps into it. And so you could say if someone chose, uh, so this was for, I did a uh, project with American uh, Library Association and I wanted to trigger additional questions every time someone said, I like this one product. And every time they chose a product from the list that they liked, and then it would ask them, why did you like it? And what would you like to, would you like to see it again? Um, and so I used, so it was a quick way to grind and grab, grab data. Uh, and I was able to parse through it really fast using Typeform. Um, one thing that I always tell people to do though as well, is if you're doing, if you spend the time in making a survey, um, develop an action on what you wanna do with the data before you send out the survey. Uh, and this is really good for those individuals that you know, might be on your team that say, oh, I, I really, really love this product. We should survey everyone to see if they love it too. And then you should ask, hey, if they don't love it, and they all say they don't like it, are you willing to scrap it? Are you willing to remove it? Because if they say no, then why are you gonna survey in the first place? Because at the end of the day, they don't care. Uh, so I would say develop an action plan before you launch your survey and get everyone to agree to it. And things that you want to agree on is if someone rated something bad or multiple people said something was bad, make that determination to remove it, fix it, um, and not spend money on something that people don't review well. Um, the other thing that if you do have teams uh, is understanding your efficiency. And so scheduling the correct, uh, correct amount of resources at any point in time is usually pretty difficult, uh, especially when there's people wearing multiple hats. Um, so there's a tool called shift planning, which is now called humanity um, that allows you to build the scheduling software that looks like this. Um, and so everyone that you need 
you basically assign people their skills and then you say well, on which days or which time periods do you need said skills and then it will then it pulls this all this data together you can have your employees include when they can and cannot work uh, and it'll figure out how to fill out the schedule uh, which also nice is it manages all that scheduling for you so let's say someone needs to call off for vacation or they need to switch shifts instead of them asking you to switch your shift or schedule off they go into the app they choose the the, the shift that they can't work and they say, hey, I need to swap with someone or can someone work it for me? If someone does swap, they work their shift and then they, they swap shifts essentially uh, or that individual then just work the full shift, if that makes sense. Uh, but check out Humanity. It's an it's a inexpensive tool to make scheduling a lot simpler. Um, if you were a library, um, one of the things that that I always like to tell people to figure out is how many people do you actually need at a desk or in order, and then figure out where we can use those people elsewhere to increase um, engagement or satisfaction. Um, but then usually I always get asked, well, Brian, how do you figure that out? So it's a very simple Excel calculation. Um, so we'll assume that the numbers at the top are um, how many checkouts per hour in a given month. So a Sunday at 9 a.m., I checked out 3.45 books. Uh, and then at, so next time I have on there, 9.30, I check out almost four books every Sunday. Uh, the yellow section is me determining how many people do I need, uh, or in that, in that half hour, how many people can one individual serve? So I say in 30 minutes, a person should be able to serve two folks. So that's 15 minutes per question or per checkout process. So now that'll tell me, <coughs> excuse me, about how many people I will need in order to fulfill that quota, round it up. Then I can put in how many people have now, which is the third section, and I do some simple math where I subtract top row from bottom row, and I get my variances. Uh, red is where I have too many people, um, and green is where I'm, I need some more folks. But it's a very simple calc to do, and all I'm doing is seeing how much activity I have in a given point, um, how many actions does that can one individual take? And then doing the math around it can tell me how many people I actually need. Um, I know I talked about Fiverr uh, earlier on. I leverage a lot of outsourced resource help to get things done faster and more efficiently because I know I can either spend my time working on a project that I'm not very good at or I don't have the skill set, but I can fumble my, fumble my way through it or I can focus on what I'm good at, which is, you know, marketing, sales, et cetera, uh, and hire someone else to do kind of the, the task that takes longer for me to do. So Hi Byron, it's probably my favorite, uh, where you buy hours in buckets, uh, and then you basically create a project, and then it will match you with someone that can actually complete that project for you successfully. Um, and then you can see your, your trends and your data, and if you're using Slack, it can actually integrate back into Slack for you, so you can get that real-time updates and feedback. Uh, and then here's Fiverr as well. Uh, again, it's a, it's a tool set that you can have people build graphics and logos. I'm gonna breeze through a couple more slides here. So with communication, um, there's Facebook and Slack. My favorite is Slack. Here's the Facebook page. But with Slack, you can get a lot of people communicating and collaborating all together. Um, and you, you collaborate with what's on called channels on the left. Some main features are um, all these different integrations and the idea is you wanna get away from um, emailing. And so using this, you can keep the threads organized, you can keep people on task, so you know that the marketing channel is talking about marketing, for instance. Um, and then here's just like a, a screenshot from my Slack channel. Lots of different integrations, so almost there's a ton of tools that are out there, um, third-party tools that you can link back into Slack if you're using Zendesk, for instance, for ticketing, or Jira for um, bug development. Um, so almost everything seems to have an integration uh, is what it feels like. Uh, and then you can invite people from outside your organization to co collaborate with you. Um, this requires you to have a paid account but you can basically build a channel inside your Slack that you can then invite external guests to communicate and collaborate with you. Um, as an example, I always like to do for libraries is, let's say you have an email address that you need action items on, so such as a book request. 
you can set up a very simple process. So every time someone emails book request at your library.com, you can get a, sl a Slack notification saying, hey, this person wants a book uh, ordered. And there's an app called Smooch. So instead of sitting on Facebook Messenger, Twitter Messenger, and all of those things, what Smooch does is it syncs uh, messages on those platforms and pushes them back into Slack. So you can respond through Slack instead of having to be on Facebook, Instagram, and all those other ones. Um, and this is high Byron uh, Slack integration. I even have Twitter integrated on my Slack, which has been very useful. So when people accidentally tweet something uh, and I've been tagged on it, I have a forever copy on my Slack channel now of what they tweeted. Um, and then using emojis, you can use emojis to keep track of what you're working on and what you're doing. Uh, with email, uh, most people use Google Apps or Office 365. But you do have to pay for those. Uh, some of my other integrated email apps are Boomerang, Assistant.2, Calendar. and Calendar.help. I'll just briefly talk about those. Um, Boomerang, what lets you to do is allows you to re to schedule uh, when you want to send messages out, and then it rates your message to see how likely people are going to respond to it. And then it can also, if no one responds, it can ping you and remind you that no one's responded to you, uh, which is really great for trying to keep on track of people that are terrible with replying to emails. Uh, this is assistant.2 for scheduling. And what it'll do is it'll query your own email calendar. And when you email someone to set up a meeting, it will figure out your availability, send them an email with a copy of that availability. They just have to click on when, when you're free and then does all the scheduling for you. One of my favorite AIs is calendar.help. And what you do is you copy Cortana from Microsoft um, after you sign up. And then Cortana will actually schedule a meeting with whoever you've added on the thread. It'll email everybody on a thread, figure out the best time to meet for everybody, and then add calendar invites for everyone. And then if someone asks to reschedule or cancel, it does all that work for you. Uh, and then the last, last fun tool is Calendly. Uh, it's another tool very similar to Assistant.2 that will, that you can have it sync across multiple calendars. If you had six or seven email accounts with different calendars on it, um, it can sync all that into one. And then when people want to meet, uh, it will query that. Uh, and based off of, like your rules and conditions, it will schedule a meeting for it for you. Um, when you're talking about project management, like we talked about earlier, uh, some of them on the top ones are Asana, Trello, and Wonderless. Uh, most of them do the Kaban boards where you basically move items from to do, doing, and done. Um, each of these are little boxes that you can click on and then drag over. Um, when we talk about site hosting is the other, is another tool that everyone talks about. Google Cloud and Amazon Web Servers are your big powerhouse servers. But if you were a startup, just starting off, uh, I encourage you to use something very simple like Bluehost. It's only a few bucks a month and you get a very basic website. Granted, it can't do a lot, um, but it's inexpensive and it gets you into the door. Um, once you get to a point, you'll also probably want to monitor and track what's happening on with your websites because you don't want your site to be down, especially if you're doing a big marketing campaign. That's the most embarrassing thing in the world. Um, so using a tool like Pingdom, you can find out if your status page is up, how long it's been up, and you can get alerted as soon as it goes down. Um, a new one that I've been using is called Fresh Ping um, because Pingdom has changed what they give away for free. So Fresh Ping is another one. Um, if you're doing interactions or, or doing tickets, um, use Fresh Desk. It's free for up to three agents. So. I always encourage people to always track interactions and communications, questions and problems, because um, then you can leverage that later on down the road if you're expanding or, or if you're trying to um, build knowledge articles, for instance. Uh, a couple other general resources, um, angel.co lets you find jobs with startups. Um, use LinkedIn, always leverage your network. Kickstarter Indiegogo is, I've used it for actually meeting people. Um, that are or in similar industries as I am, uh, so that I can kind of uh, bounce ideas back and forth because I like 
coming up with new ideas and seeing what other people are working on. Um, so I use Kickstarter Indiegogo to help me find new folks um, that are doing really great things that I want to be involved in. Um, so the last thing that I want to leave you with uh, is always have a strategy in place. So if you're developing a plan or you're onboarding something, um, know that not everything always works out. Um, and so every plan A needs a plan B. Don't assume that, uh, and this goes to when you're choosing a, a tool for even. Um, I always kind of privately test out a tool before I share it with my colleagues because I want to make sure this tool works. So I don't want everyone to learn how the tool, to, what the tool does. Uh, and then find out it still doesn't do the main thing I'm trying to accomplish. Um, a little project management joke. So kind of just in general, uh, I talked a lot about different tools that you can use. There's tons out there. Um, it's always good to, if you're, if you're a library listening, um, teaching patrons and all these different tools that are out there to be successful, um, show them how it is and how to use it. Uh, there's usually not too big of a learning curve with all these cloud tools because people, because those companies want you to use it. So they want to make it as easy as possible. <coughs> And again, if you're a library, set up project management, employee management, surveys, all these skills for people to learn so they can be successful in running their own business or running their own ideas. Uh, and the last thing uh, I always tell people to do is always have fun. Um, and so always, always have a good time with what you're doing, um, partner with your employees. Uh, so me and my one employee, we decided we wanted to get matching shirts. I'm not really sure why, what spawned that. Um, but we, we bought these Buffalo plaid shirts and I was told they looked, I'm the guy on the right. Uh, I was told it looked just like, uh, Richard Karn. So we decided to tweet, tweet to him to see what he thought. Uh, and we got a response, which I thought was, was pretty cool. So that's it. I know I threw out tons of info at you today. If you're listening in or watching the recording, you can always reach out after the fact, be more than happy to kind of discuss further, um, share more links, give you more tools. Um, these are some of my more favorite or more popular tools that I've used or leveraged, but there's new tools I stumble across every day, like Fresh Ping I started using uh, like two weeks ago um, to monitor my website instead. So are there any questions, comments, concerns? Um, what do you do to host your website? Uh, I actually have my own hosting company. Um, so I use uh, Libchalk Hosting to host, uh, which is my own, it's my own server farm. Um, to host my website. Um, you're welcome for the information as well. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure sharing these things. Um, looking for something free or nearly? Uh, I would say then, then use Bluehost. Like it's like $3.95 a month, I think, uh, for like the first year. Yeah, so check out like Bluehost. It's like $3.95 or $2.95 if you can find a coupon. Um, so for, for, for the first year, that's enough time to at least, you know, see what people think and if it's, if it's usable. Uh, or uh, this deal might still be, be going on. So if you go to Slack Social and search for Boxney, which I'll type in the chat, that's B-O-X-N-E, uh, they had a, a promotion where it was $40 for a lifetime host. Uh, I was like, for 40 bucks, might as well and just try it out. And it works really well. So for 40 bucks, you get a forever host. Um, the, there's a little asterisk that says, you know, if you don't reach out in five years, we're going to cancel. Otherwise, you have to email us and say you still want to use your service, and then we extend it for another five. Um, but they say it is lifetime, so we'll see. But box me, $40 for forever. And I did air quotes, which you couldn't see, but um, so Slack social. Let's see if I can find the link, too. Uh, any experience with Design Crowd? No, I haven't heard of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've, I've used Fiverr like a lot. Um, you do sometimes get what you pay for, but for like I needed a graphic designed once, but for five bucks, it was a, it was a, it was a real nice $5 graphic that did what I needed. Um, but don't expect like the world uh, for some of those things. Yes, I will. So I have, I post all my slides on SlideShare. So if you go to slideshare.net slash epitchman, oops, 
slideshare.net slash. Um, I'll post it there within the next few minutes and then I'll also send it out uh, to do space if they would like to share it with their registered users. Are there any other questions? Uh, someone asked, looking for developers to help design an online app product, any suggestions? I would start with um, Boxney then, or not, sorry, not Boxney. I would start with Fiverr uh, to see if there is anything available um, to kind of do that uh, and, and what that cost would be. Someone asked, how would you go about estimating costs when hiring a company to develop a website, app development, or brand implementation? Uh, it varies. So depending on the complexity of it, like I've designed a website, so it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, just informational, you can usually get that for 500 to thousand dollars, a real nice informational only website. If you're going into more um, store, store design or having a checkout system, uh, it usually goes up in the thousands. Um, yes, Fiverr does do like app development as well. You kind of do a little bit of digging, um, but there are people that can do that for you. Um, there's the Boxney plan I, I talked about earlier. Um, so it's, it says it's only $40 for quote unquote lifetime. Um, that seems to be working fine. I, I think I bought it a month ago uh, just to kind of play with. But yeah, uh, good, good questions. Are there any other questions? Perfect. If there's nothing else, you can always feel free to reach out after the fact as well. Uh, it was very nice talking with everyone. Hopefully uh, you have some new things to try out.